Mayangaga Senior Tanantanan, excited to kick off a new year this morning as we do a prophecy update. We're going to take a look at the current events that we're reading about every day or at least every week in the news in light of what the Bible says about the things that are going to happen in the last days. Before we get into our study this morning, let's open up with a word of prayer. Salamat niyo at gino para sa ining nga bago nga tuig gino. This new year you've given to us, Lord, but we get to continue to put our faith, our trust, our confidence in you. Continue to look to you, because Jesus, it is all about you. This morning, fathers, we talk about some of the current events, the things that are dominating our news and how that are being talked about frequently, in light of what you say is going to happen in the last days, the signs, the times, and the seasons. We pray that you stir up our heart to the fact that lapit na lang git ka ginoon, Lord, you're coming soon to get us. So bless this time. Meet us, we pray and ask. In Jesus' name we say, Amen. Well, before we get into looking at some of the current events that are taking place, I thought it'd be a, a good start to talk about why Bible prophecy is important to begin with. For the ability to foretell the future is something that God and God alone can do. Well, that's Iban. Neither Satan, nor the angels, nor any man has the ability to see beyond the moment. Nothing can see the future. No one can tell you what's going to happen except for God alone. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 and 10, the Lord says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God, wala kampara sa akon. I declare the end from the beginning. So God and God alone has the ability to foretell events, the future, before they come to pass. He then puts that future telling, those prophecies, in His Word to validate that indeed the Bible is from Him. We might call it His fingerprint or His proof, His validation that His Word is authoritatively indeed from God Almighty. And therefore, Bible prophecy becomes incredibly important for us and it pertains to, as it pertains to, us having confidence in His Word. But specifically for us, it goes beyond that. And then it should get us excited about the fact that God talks about the events we're seeing today, letting us know the times we are living in are the end times. We tend to forget, we tend to get caught up in our daily lives, that at any moment Jesus could come for his church. You know, we think about or we're focusing on, uh, you know, what do we want for breakfast? And oh, para panyaga. Uh, we tend to think about, you know, what kind of work do I have to do today? What needs to take place uh, before I go to bed tonight? We don't tend to think that the days are short and the return of Jesus Christ is near and the signs we see all around us foretold prophetically by God who sees the end from the beginning are giving us that hint, that warning that we need to get ready because this could be the day we see Jesus Christ. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3-4, through 4, Peter writes and says, I want to remind you that in the last days there will be scoffers who will laugh at the truth and do every evil thing they desire. This will be their argument. Jesus promised to come back, did he? So where is he? You know, the world around us says, Ah, Jesus, you've been talking about his return for how many generations now? You know, your father, your Lola, your grandfather, your great-grandfather. They all talked about the return of Jesus Christ, and as of now, he still has not come back. Therefore, maybe he will never come. But the reality is, as we're going to look at this morning, prophetically, what we see happening around us in current events, speak to Jesus coming very soon. And that realization, that understanding that any day the Lord could come get us, according to 1 John 3, 3, is a purifying hope. It helps us to live our life in such a way that we're ready to see the Lord. Well, that being said, let's pick up our study this morning in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to spend the majority of our time in this particular text, in particular in verses 1 through 3. For we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, concerning the times 
and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. So when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. So Paul, writing to the church of Thessalonica, talks about the last days or the end times. And he says particularly concerning times and seasons, I have no reason to write unto you. Now both of these words are interesting. The word time and the word season speak about how we know what is going to occur. Let me explain. If you want to know anor ora subong, what time is it? Is it time for breakfast, lunch, panyopon, dinner? Is it time to wake up or time to go to bed? We tell that by looking at the time, anor ora subong. So it is by the time we gauge what we're supposed to do and what's going to happen in our lives on a daily basis. Seasons speaks of broader periods of time. There's a season to go to school. If you're still young, you have to escuela kara edlao. Kung maidad ka na, once we get older, that's when we get to go to work. There's a season to be married, a season to have children, a season to have grandchildren. So seasons speak of broader periods of time in our life. Time, edlao edlao. Seasons, more dealing with greater numbers of years. But both of them focus in on how we know what is going to happen in our lives. Paul here addresses it in terms of Bible prophecy. We are expected to know our seasons, our times in concerns to Bible prophecy, so we know what's going to happen in relation to the return of Jesus Christ, in particular the day of the Lord. Now, hula lang anay. For this term, day of the Lord, is an incredibly important one as we talk about Bible prophecy, in particular end times prophecy. How are all things going to come to an end? I know not the boat sa katapusang, sang tiempo, at the end of days. The term is used a total of 32 times in the Bible. 27 in the Old Testament, 5 in the New Testament. Always in relation to the events that will occur culminating in the creation of a new heaven and a new earth. Now, although it says, ang edlao sang Jos, the day of the Lord, don't think of this as a day. It's speaking of the period that encompasses all of the events that are going to conclude by Jesus creating a new heaven and a new earth. And the question becomes, what are the signs the times and the seasons, that tell us that this day of the Lord is quickly approaching. In this morning, we want to look at four of them. We want to talk about four particular signs that tell us the time and the season we are living in is indeed one that is going to quickly end up and lead up to the day of the Lord. All of them, by the way, taken right from the headlines we read on a weekly basis in our newspapers, on our feeds, in, in our Facebook posts, if you may. The first one comes out of Luke chapter 21, verse 11. Luke 21, 11. Turn there with me, if you will. Jesus, speaking in what we call the Olivet Discourse, where he discusses with his disciples what will happen that leads up to the day of the Lord, exact same context, talking about end times prophecy, tells them there in verse 11, there will be great earthquakes in various places, famine and pestilences, and there will be fearful signs, great signs from the heavens. Two things in this one verse pop right out at us. For two of them have correlation, relation to the things we're seeing on a daily basis. One of them is this idea of pestilences. Now, a pestilence is simply a disease. We might say a virus. It doesn't take much to talk about or to think about what major headline have we been looking at for the last two years in relation to a virus that has affected the whole world. 
Of course, the answer is obviously COVID-19. We have had a pandemic that is a pestilence unlike we have seen in a generation or two. It's been quite some time since we've seen anything comparable to this. But I do find COVID-19 interesting. Now, certainly, it is a rather devastating pandemic. You've had over 283 million people to date who have been contracted by COVID-19. Some 5 million have died from this disease. So certainly a devastating and heartbreaking pandemic that has affected the world as a whole. But there is something unique about this. COVID-19, for the vast majority of people, is not dangerous. 95% of the population, when they contract COVID-19, have at best mild symptoms. Many of them are asymptomatic. It's only about 5% of the population that is affected, and of that 5%, only 2% die. So although it is definitely devastating, we don't want to downplay that. And many have died from it, 5 million to date. That's a, a catastrophic number. It still seems interesting that the governments of the world, everywhere in the world, there is no exception, have dealt with this particular virus with the extreme measures and lockdowns that they have. And so the question becomes, why? Why have governments gone so crazy, been so strict, so severe in dealing with this particular plague, pestilence, pandemic? Two reasons that I might give to you. The first one is quite practical. We might sit there and say, hey, if only 5% of the population is subjected severely and only 2% die, why is this virus then so dangerous? Take a city like Bacolod. The city of Bacolod has about 500,000 people in it. If only 5% of that population, which would add up to 25,000 people, got sick all at once with COVID and needed to be hospitalized, that would quickly overwhelm any health care capacity that existed within the city. So it would be devastating, even though only 5% are affected, if everyone got it all at once. And so the idea behind the lockdowns, quite simply, is to slow down. It's not to stop the virus, but to slow it down so that it doesn't overwhelm the health care system. That makes sense, and that's very valid and true as to why these restrictions have been put in place. But there is a darker side. When you talk about COVID passports, lockdowns that say where you can go, who can buy food, can you even go to church? These things I personally would hold to are actually laying the ground for something more insidious that's going to be coming down the road not too far in the future. I read an article the other day, one that caught my attention rather quickly. They're testing in Sweden a little microchip. It's a tiny little device. It's RFID. It broadcasts information that can be placed under the skin in your hand, and they want to use it as a COVID passport so that when you walk into a restaurant, a building, a grocery store, if you try to fly on a plane, travel on a boat, travel on a bus, you're instantly validated as having been vaccinated and so you're allowed in. Now when I saw that, a little chip that fits in your hand, that are used, used, can be used to allow you access, to allow you to buy, to allow you to sell, it wasn't much of a jump to look forward to where this might one day be pointing towards. For in Revelation chapter 13, verse 17, we're told there will come a day when no one will buy or sell except they have the mark. And the number of the beast, for the number is of a man, it is the number six. Six, six. Now I need to clarify. There is no current COVID passport. There is no current chip that is the mark of the beast. But do I see, do I believe, these things are leading up to, they're laying the groundwork, paving the roads for what will one day become the mark of the beast. And I would say, yes, there's probably a really good possibility that is the case. We are prepping a global community to accept one particular kind of ID, 
to allow you to buy, sell, travel, even enter a building or a restaurant. This is something I absolutely could see laying the preparation for the things to come that we see in the book of Revelation. Pestilences certainly are in our news. That sign is evident today. But there's a second sign that we see coming out of this Luke 21, 11, and that's the terrifying signs. I've always been fascinated by this particular word, for it's only found here that is a biloxa New Testament. Well, that's a Iban. It's actually a compound word that means terrifying or frightening technology. Now, I smile because if you think about what technology existed when this was written, it wasn't particularly terrifying. I mean, the greatest weapons of the day when, you know, John, Luke, Peter, Paul, even Jesus walked the earth was a sword, spading, maybe a bow and arrow. And not that you would necessarily want to run into a trained soldier with one of those, but I wouldn't call them a terrifying technology per se. But over the past hundred years, our technology has gone absolutely bonkers. We've gone from horse and carriage to spaceships and landing on the moon in a mere century. And our technology along with that has become increasingly terrifying. We have invented over that same period the atomic weapon, the nuclear bomb. That is a terrifying piece of technology. A single piece of artillery that can be dropped on a city and level it, killing hundreds of thousands in mere seconds. That I would call very scary. And what's scariest is who wants to get these weapons. You may, if you watch the news, have heard that the nation of Iran, we're going to be talking quite a bit about these this morning, the nation of Iran is an important player in end time prophecy. But Iran has been striving to obtain nuclear technology because they want a nuclear bomb. Now why would a little nation in the middle of the Middle East, Russia's to the north, Saudi Arabia's to the south, they've got Afghanistan to the east, to the west you've got Turkey. Why do they want nuclear weapons? What great terror or threat do they have against them that they feel nuclear weapons are necessary? For one reason and one reason only. Iran has openly stated, they do not hide this, that they want a nuclear bomb so they can drop it on Israel. They believe their passion, their goal, their purpose in this life is to wipe the Jewish nation off the face of planet Earth. Therefore, to put that kind of technology into that kind of a crazy mentality with a nation like Iran leads us up to very scary times indeed. Certainly terrifying to be sure. But when we read about these things, we read about terrifying technology, nuclear weapons in the hands of rogue nations, we read about pestilences causing lockdowns all around the world, these things should not scare us. They should excite us because the Bible tells us these things are the birth pains that lead up to the coming of the Messiah. We can see the return of Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 21, verse 28, just a couple of verses down from the passage we're in. Notice that it says, when you see these things happen, look up for your redemption draws nigh. But there's a third thing we want to talk about in relation to current events. Not just pestilences, not just terrifying technology, but also the nation of Israel. We can't overlook this or overstate just how important it is that Israel is a nation once again. For historically, Israel was destroyed, scattered, ceased to exist, after two major conquests, and these conquests were quite some time ago. 722 BC, the kingdom of Assyria conquered the northern tribe of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel. In 586 BC, Babylon conquered the southern kingdom of Israel. So this is some 2,500 years ago, Israel ceased to exist as a nation. 
Now it's true that a small remnant were allowed to return back after 70 years of captivity. But that remnant never became an independent nation again. They were always under the control of some other major empire, be it they were under Babylonian, Medo-Persian, Grecian, Roman control. They never were a sovereign nation again until May 14, 1948. Now that's important because God told us this would happen. In fact, the prophet Isaiah would say in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 5, I will bring your descendants, so many years down the road, from the east, gather them from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar, from the ends of the earth. Isaiah predicted this massive influx from Jews from all over the world coming back to Israel to be reborn again. Jesus himself would speak about this in Mark chapter 13, verse 28, when he gave the parable of the fig tree. He said, when you see a fig tree blossom, my bungana, you know that summer is close. In the same way, the generation that sees Israel reborn, the fig tree is a picture of Israel. When they come back to life, when they come back from the dead, Ezekiel chapter 37, the valley of dry bones standing up once again. When you see that event take place, in that generation, all things will come to an end. We, Gita, have seen the rebirth of Israel, meaning we are the last generation. It does bring up two important questions. Number one, when was Israel reborn? Number two, how long is a generation? The first question, there are two dates most people will throw out. Either May 14th, 1948, which is when Israel was declared a nation for the first time after more than 2,500 years. Or some say, no, it's June 7th, 1967, when Israel, after the Six-Day War, was able to recapture the city of Jerusalem for the first time and reclaim it as their holy capital, where they regained the Temple Mount once again. Take your pick. Either date is fine, not sure which is right, but both would work as being the rebirth of the nation. As to the second question, how long is a generation? The longest a generation in the Bible is, is a hundred years. According to Genesis chapter 15, verse 16, it is a hundred year period per generation. And there are some shorter measurements, but that would be the longest. So the very least amount of time, the soonest that we would expect is take 100 years from 1948 or 100 years from 1967. Within that time frame, all things written about the day of the Lord, the end times prophecies, the conclusion of the word of God will take place. We are the generation that's going to see the return of our Lord. We know it because as we look in the news, as we watch current events, we have seen the rebirth of Israel. Which brings us to a fourth event we want to deal with and talk about in relation to these current events and end times prophecy, and that is the Magog invasion. If you've not heard of this, in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, there is a prophecy concerning a multitude of nations who will come to attack Israel. Now, this multitude of nations, it's not hard to figure out who they are, though the names used are old names, names that date back thousands of years. You can, through a little bit of checking of history, correlate who they belong to in modern terms, and you find out it is Russia, that's Magog, as well as the Muslim countries that surround Israel, including Iran, Ethiopia, Turkey, Libya, and several others. Now this didn't make sense until we came into modern times. Why would Russia ally itself with Muslim nations? If you do not know your history, you're bound to repeat your history. And I fear many times we are ignorant 
of even the most recent of events in our past. Some of you may know this, many of you may not, but Russia used to be called the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was not just Russia, it was about half of Europe as well, it was a massive global power, one of the two main world powers for over 50 years after World War II, that dominated all politics. They were a communist, socialist nation that was godless and had a desire to take over all of the world. Now, fortunately, the Soviet Union failed. In 1990, it collapsed. It fell apart. And when it fell apart, the core nation of Russia looked to find help in rebuilding from the calamity in the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Empire. They looked to Europe first. Russia said, Europe, will you help us out in rebuilding? Europe went, not a chance. <laughs> you fought us in a Cold War for 50 years. We don't trust you. We don't like you. And so Europe refused to help. So Russia looked to the east. China, will you help us out? China said, you know, not so much. We're going to work in our own empire here. We're building our own base of power here in the east. We really don't want to deal with you there in Russia anymore. So Russia looked west, nothing. Russia looked east, nothing. So Russia instead turned to the south, to the Muslim nations, and found an unusual friend. Now, politically, not much in common. Religiously, definitely nothing in common. Monetarily, a lot in common. Because the Muslims had Damo Quarta, massive oil fields. Russia had advanced military. And it was a beautiful harmony and match between the two of them is the Muslim world poured money into Russia and Russia poured military power and expertise into the Muslim world. And suddenly you had this alliance, exactly what we see in Ezekiel 38 and 39, of the Muslim world drawing Russia into a war with Israel. Now let me set the scene as to what we're seeing today. You may have read recently that there is a problem with the Ukraine. Ukraine is a country in Eastern Europe that borders on Russia. It used to be part of the Soviet Union, broke off in 1990. Russia has recently put 120,000 troops, hardened, battle-tested troops, on the border of Ukraine. If you put... 120,000 troops on the border of a sovereign nation. It's not because you're friends. Russia is doing this as a prelude to war. They are openly podcasting, broadcasting, telecasting that they're about to attack, invade Ukraine. Which raises the obvious question, why would Russia want to attack Ukraine? What did Ukraine do to them? It goes back to pre-Soviet Union times. It goes back to the era after World War II. When the Soviet Union came to power, the West formed a coalition, a peace treaty, if you will, a, a, a bond called NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And the whole idea was NATO was to protect Western countries, Europe, from the advances of the Soviet Union and Russia. But after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1990, there really was no longer a purpose for NATO. But it was still there, still very well funded, still very well armed. And all of the nations that used to be a part of the Soviet Union started to want to join NATO to give themselves access to the West, to kind of become friends with the West in Europe and distance themselves from Russia. Russia wasn't so happy about this. Because you can imagine a nation like Ukraine, which is right on the border of Russia, just a, a couple of dozen miles from Moscow, the capital of Russia. Can you imagine if Ukraine began to put missiles, armament from the West, from Europe, pointed towards Russia that close to their capital? Not very settling. It was very disturbing to the Russian president, Vladimir Putin. And he's openly stated, if Ukraine joins NATO, he will invade them. He's done it before. Back in 2008, the country of Georgia, a little further south in Europe, tried to join NATO. Russia did invade. 
invade, turned over the president, put a president in place who was more friendly towards Russia so they would never ever join NATO. They will do the same thing to Ukraine. Russia, if Ukraine insists on joining NATO, will invade this sovereign Western nation. This has gotten a lot of attention in the media. A lot of the Western countries are painting this as a threat against democracy. Russia doesn't care if Ukraine is democratic. They just don't want Western militaries, Western missiles placed inside of Ukraine pointed at them. Kind of understand that. It makes some sense. But you go, why do we care? Let me talk about China. For China wants Taiwan. Let me give you a bit more history. The year is 1948. The World War II has recently ended, just come to a conclusion. There is a civil war that quickly follows in China between two groups. The communist CCCP, the Communist Chinese Party, and the Democratic Party of China, which is called the Republic of China, the ROC. So the CCP and the ROC are in a civil war against one another for control of China after World War II. The CCP wins. Communism takes over all of mainland China. The Republic of China, those who were democratic, those who wanted a democratic government, fled to the island of Taiwan. Taiwan is not its own country. Taiwan is not a different nationality. Taiwan is Chinese who fled after World War II, desiring to have a democratic government, but were defeated by communist China when it took over the mainland. For the better part of 50 years now, there has been great tension between these two groups because China, mainland communist, looks at Taiwan and says, you belong to us. Your island belongs to us. Your people belong to us. You are Chinese and you need to come home. You need to be absorbed back into the country that you ran and fled from. They see them as an uprising separatist group that needs to be quelled and brought back into the fold. But China hesitates. Because of the democracy of Taiwan, the Western world protects it. Although not officially, there is no treaties. There is an unofficial stance that if China ever attacked, tried to absorb Taiwan, Europe and the U.S. would step in and protect them. But what if Europe is caught up in a war over Ukraine? Russia invades Ukraine. There's a great distraction there. All Western powers are focused on what's happening there in Europe. China now sees its opportunity. Now, they've been talking a lot about this. If you're following the news, there's been many articles, many statements recently from China, very provocative moves showing the fact they think the time is right to retake Taiwan. A war in Europe, a problem there with Ukraine would be the perfect opportunity for China to step in and reabsorb and begin their conquest, if you will, of Asia. Now, is a historical validation of this when Hitler, back in 1938, began his war in Europe, that's when Japan began their war in Asia. European powers are distracted. It frees up Asian powers to do what they want. There's precedent for China moving on Taiwan if Russia moves on Ukraine. Now, you're still going. Why do we care? Iran. Because Iran would have the opportunity in the midst of all of this to move against Israel. If Russia's caught up in Ukraine and causing all kinds of how about about there, and China is dealing with Taiwan, the world right now doesn't even care what else is happening, and Iran can do what it's always wanted to do, which is come against Israel. That is the Magog invasion of Ezekiel 38 and 39 could easily unfold in the very days in which we are now living. It could be 2022 is the year where it all begins. Is it for sure? We'll look at a moment. Can't say. But certainly a very distinct possibility. And the Magog invasion is either right before or right after the rapture of the church. Which brings us back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Turn back there with me, if you will. For in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, knowing the times and the seasons in which we live, 
we're told that the day of the Lord, first and foremost, comes as a thief in the night. Now, I love this description of this idea of a thief in the night because it means the day of the Lord begins at a time and a day which no one can know about. Kung may kawatan sa gabi, wala ka balo ano oras maabot siya. That's why he can break into the house. That's why he can steal. You don't know when or where he's going to strike. That is how the day of the Lord begins. What starts the day of the Lord? Well, the event that seems to correlate best to this thief in the night is the rapture of the church. You go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. We're told that Jesus Christ will blow the trumpet call. And he will call the saints of the earth to him and all of us, every believer, we will be caught up in the air. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 53, and a moment of an eye and a twinkle. And we will be translated. We will be brought into the presence of the Lord. We will be with him forevermore. This is what begins the day of the Lord. Like a thief in the night, the rapture of the church occurs and we are out of here as God prepares to pour his wrath upon a God-rejecting world. We do not know when. In fact, in Mark chapter 13, verse 32, we're told only the Father in heaven knows the day and the hour in which all of this will begin. But though we don't know exactly when, we do know the times and the seasons. We are not caught off guard. We are not meant to wonder and say, well, maybe it's layot layot gid pa. No, lapit lapit gid pa. Again, we are the last generation. We are the ones who will see the Lord, hear the trumpet, be called to heaven. And it could happen at any day to begin the day of the Lord. But once the church is taken out, once the church has been raptured, what takes place next gets very interesting. For notice there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3, the statement of peace and safety will be declared. Now this is a loaded statement. For the idea of peace and safety speaks of the fact the world is in great calamity. The world is in absolute chaos, which you can understandably recognize would be the case. Put yourself in the position of what's taking place at this particular moment in time. The rapture of the church has occurred. They're gone. They disappear. Thousands upon tens of thousands upon hundreds of thousands, hopefully millions of people are gone. On top of that, you've had a Magog invasion. Russia drawn in, hooks in their jaws to a war with Israel by the Muslim world around them, are miraculously destroyed by Jesus Christ. God intervenes to protect Israel. So the armies of Russia, the armies of all the Muslim nations are in chaos. Millions of people gone. The world's in absolute uproar. And one man steps up. And he says, peace and safety. We know this man by many different names. He's called the son of perdition. He's called the big mouth in Daniel chapter 7 verse 8. Because he says a lot of things. But we know him best by his title from 1 John chapter 2 verse 18. He is the anti-Christ. Now personally, I believe this man is alive today. I believe that he is probably... In Europe somewhere, a leader that we don't recognize yet because he has not yet stood up to appoint himself the role that has been ordained to him. For if he stood up now, every spirit-filled believer in this world would point their finger and go, that man is bad. Do not follow that man. But once the church is gone, once the Spirit of God has been removed by removing the church, that opens the door for this man to step up and proclaim peace and safety. He's the one that's going to bring organization to a chaotic world that is in turmoil. And he'll do this by doing several things. First and foremost, he'll bring a peace treaty between Israel and the Muslim world. Imagine the aftermath of the Magog invasion. There's some hard feelings, very old hard feelings between Israel and the Muslims and the Muslim nations. And the Antichrist will find a way to bring them together, bring them to the negotiating table 
and he will rebuild the third temple. First temple, Temple of Solomon. Second temple, Herod's temple. That was from the days of Jesus Christ. The third temple will be the temple that the Antichrist builds. There on the Temple Mount, north of the Dome of the Rock, he won't destroy that. It'll be allowed to remain. It'll fit. You go to Israel, you can see there's plenty of space up there to put a temple alongside the Dome of the Rock and thereby make peace between the Muslim world and Israel. And the Jews, because of this, will accept him as the Messiah. The Jews will believe the Antichrist is the Christ. In John chapter 5, verse 43, Jesus said, I have come in my Father's name, but you did not receive me. Another will come in his own name, him, the Antichrist, you will receive. Well, not just peace between Israel and the Muslim countries. He'll bring peace to the whole world. He'll do it by stabilizing the economies of the world. As previously mentioned, he'll come up with a little system called the mark. You take the mark, you can buy, you can sell. It is the number of man. It is the number of 666. By the way, if sometime in the future you happen to listen to this message and a bunch of Christians disappeared and there was a Magog invasion in Russia and a bunch of Muslim countries were wiped out miraculously and one man steps up and says, you need to take a mark? Don't do it. Because to take the mark is damnation. You cannot be saved once you receive the mark of the beast. But it will bring stability to the economic system of the world. He'll also stabilize religions of the world, for he will proclaim himself as God Almighty. More on that in a minute. But he will also stabilize all of the governments of the world, for he will be the one world government. One religion, one government, one financial system for the whole world. Peace and safety. But notice again in verse 3 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, this peace and safety only last until there is sudden destruction. Now this idea of sudden destruction doesn't mean that it is unpredictable. The destruction is very much something that is foretold and we know what's going to happen. It's just when it will take place is a bit of a question. In fact, Paul uses the same illustration that Jesus uses. It's like a woman who gives birth. As a woman prepares to give birth, there is labor pains that get closer and closer the sooner it comes for the baby to come out. The closer we get to the time of the conclusion of the day of the Lord, the more intense the trials and tribulations will become, telling us of the destruction that God is about to pour out upon the world. What is the sudden destruction? It's the book of Revelation, chapter 6 through 18. The judgments of God, there are 21 of them. There are seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls, 21 in all. Judgment that God will pour out upon a God-rejecting world that are so severe that if God did not limit it to just seven years, no one would survive. Now the good news is, is we will not be here. We will not be around for this judgment because we are raptured before the tribulation begins. Now I know there is some controversy on this within Christianity amongst different churches. There are some churches who say, no, we will go through the tribulation and the rapture occurs at the end of it. We're kind of shot up in the air and come right back down with Jesus Christ after the seven years of tribulation. But that doesn't seem to line up biblically. The problem with a post-tribulation or post-trib perspective is that the rapture occurs in a day and in an hour when no one expects, like a thief in the night. And if it came at the end of the tribulation, you would know exactly when it would occur. For from what we call the abomination of desolation, when the Antichrist stands up and declares himself God three and a half years into the tribulation, right in the middle, from that point, when he declares himself God, you have exactly three and a half years until the return of Jesus Christ. So if the rapture was at the end of the tribulation, 
you would know the exact day that it would occur because it would occur three and a half years after the abomination of desolation when the Antichrist declares himself as God. But others say, well, no, it's not at the end of the tribulation. It's It's mid-tribulation. Pero may problema pa. For if the rapture is mid-tribulation, which, by the way, they line up with the trumpet blasts. For there are seven trumpets, and they say the last and final trumpet, the seventh trumpet, is the one from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 where God calls the saints home. But there's already wrath being poured out by that point. And according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, we the church are not appointed to the wrath of God. And even before that seventh trumpet, there's plenty of wrath. There's seven seals of judgment that have already been broken. There's six trumpets that have already been blown. That culminating in over 60% of the world already perishing. That's wrath. And so since we're not appointed to wrath, it doesn't seem to line up that we go through that even first three and a half years of tribulation. Where are we? We're in heaven for all seven years. Jesus comes before, pulls us out before the sudden destruction that marks the seven years of tribulation that God pours out upon a God-rejecting world. But there is a fourth thing we want to notice in relation to this day of the Lord, and that is the return of Jesus Christ. For at the end of the seven years of tribulation, according to Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 21, Jesus will come riding out of heaven. Now, important distinction. In the rapture, we go up to meet Jesus. At the second coming of Christ, he comes down out of heaven, riding that white horse with the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords upon his thigh. We, kita, tanantana mga tao ng luas, we will come with him according to Jude chapter 1 verse 14. We'll all have our own horses riding after Jesus Christ. We'll step down upon the Mount of Olives. Jesus says that will crack in two according to Zechariah chapter 14 verse 4, providing water to the Dead Sea, giving life to it again. But then he'll turn to us and say, You guys just wait here. And he alone will go to a place called Har Megiddo. We would say Armageddon. Where with one word, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, he will defeat the Antichrist, all of his armies, and the tribulation will come to a conclusion. At which point Jesus will set up his millennial kingdom here upon the earth. According to Revelation chapter 20, verse 3, he will rule and reign here upon the world for 1,000 years. Now this is a good time to be around. This is when the lion lays down with a lamb. This is when there's absolute peace and tranquility. The world as God intended it with Jesus ruling and reigning over it. And we, we believers who were raptured and brought up to heaven before the tribulation begins, we will rule and reign with Jesus Christ. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 2 through 3, we will reign alongside him for a glorious thousand years. Awesome time. But it does come to an end. According to Revelation chapter 20, verse 3, at the end of that thousand years, Satan, who has been bound up in a bottomless pit throughout the whole millennial reign, will be loosed one final time for one last rebellion, and then comes the great white throne judgment. What will take place is all men, they will all stand before Jesus Christ. And there will be two books opened. One book is called the Book of Life. Basta imonalan sa Book of Life, pwede masalo, pwede masalangit. Because that book of life speaks of our salvation, our faith in Jesus Christ that has given us the right to be able to come forever into the presence of the Lord. But if our name is not in the book of life, then the books are opened. Presumably this is the record of all of our actions, all of our words, even all of our thoughts, so that we may be judged by them. Now don't misunderstand. This is not a judgment to see whether or not we can go to heaven or not. 
This is the judgment so we know why we cannot go to heaven. There's only one way to be saved. Put your name in the book of life. If the name is not there, we are judged to show us why we cannot go to heaven and we will be eternally separated as death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. Which brings us to the fifth and the final thing about the day of the Lord, which is its conclusion. We're told that at that point, after this white throne judgment, Jesus will destroy the old heavens and destroy the entire earth. Everything we see, the world around us, will disappear. According to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, with a great fiery flame, it is gone. At which point Jesus will create a new heaven and a new earth. Revelation chapter 21 and 22. No more sin, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more sickness, no more death. A perfect world as God intended it will be the conclusion of the day of the Lord. Which brings up the most important question. Are we sure we're ready for it? As we come into 2022, we see the signs. We see the times. We understand the seasons we are living in. And the question becomes, are we ready for the return of Jesus Christ? We do not want to go through the tribulation. We don't want to be those who face the wrath of God. We certainly don't want to end up before the white throne judgment without our names firmly placed in the book of life. Now you might sit there and go, Psh, I, I, I'm good pastor, I know. I believe in Jesus. My faith is firmly in the Lord. Awesome. Be ready. Know and recognize the days we are living in. Don't get caught up in the things of this life. Instead, live with a light touch looking for the return of Jesus Christ. But how about ang tupad na balay namon? How about ato mga porente, amigo, amiga? Those we love, those we care about, are we sure about them as well? Don't miss the opportunity to give people the gospel message, to tell them about the love of Jesus before it's too late. Because i got to tell you, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to call upon the Lord. Today is the day to tell someone the gospel message, to give them the hope of Jesus, because they may not have tomorrow. We are living in amazing, exciting, awesome times. We want to make sure that we're living for, telling people about Jesus Christ while we still can. 2022 may be the year we see Jesus Christ. Let's be ready and tell everyone we can to put their faith and their hope in our Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for this time. Lord, we thank you for the beginning of a new year. Lord, we thank you for the hope this may be the year. Very well, we get to see you face to face. Lord, help that to draw us closer to you, dependent upon you, looking and ready for you, Jesus. Not distracted, not discouraged, but excited by what we see happening around us. But Lord, it's not just about us, it's about our family, our friends, our loved ones, even just the people we happen to bump into at the store. Let us have the boldness and the passion to recognize time is short. Time is precious. And we need to preach you, Jesus, to everybody we can because we want to see as many as possible come to be written in the book of life that they might have eternity in that new heaven and new earth with you. So Lord, use us, we pray and ask. Give us boldness in this new year, we pray. In Jesus' name we say, amen. Looking forward to hearing what the Lord does. Keep your eye on the news. Keep your heart in the Bible. Look up because Jesus is coming soon. Love you guys. God bless you.